Hi there, welcome along. Um, I'm really excited because I've got a brand new palette. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to have a little tutorial to show you how to prep a brand new palette, how to arrange your paints, and how to put it all together for, a, for the best possible watercolour painting experience. We're moving into doing more flower painting videos, so the number of colours we're gonna be using is going up. So let's get started. Right, so here is my fancy new palette. It's called the Loxley Plastic Folding Palette and it was only 4 95 it was a real bargain. Um, so the first thing to do when you're prepping a watercolour palette is getting a little bit of uh, abrasion on the, at least the mixing wells, I mean you could go for all of these as well, but the most important thing is that your water and your colour can sit really nicely and not all like bobble up and pill up. So um, this is a bit of a trick a warning because I cannot bear um, the feeling of the um, scratching of these um, wire scourers or you could use a bit of sandpaper just a little bit of fine sandpaper could work as well but the best news for you is I did this in advance so you're not going to hear a horrible scratching but essentially what you're going to do is just get right in there and get all of these surfaces nice and just roughed up a little bit. You'll find there'll be a little bit of um, dust and stuff that comes off, so you'll want to sort of wipe that out with a bit of kitchen roll afterwards. And then we're gonna fill in our colors. Now, uh, quite often in these sessions when I talk to you I talk about using a limited pan of colors and we did the wonderful color chart back a few episodes back in watercolor for beginners where I told you how many amazing colors you can get from a very limited palette and that's fantastic um, but then there are some of us who like to use tubes of watercolor paint as opposed to to dried pans and here is a uh, assortment well it's it's pretty much one of every color that I currently own um, I go through time and I pick up different colors and I, I find that certain ones get used loads so this is for me the ultimate palette that I want you'll notice that we have got two black colors in there um, the black is a really useful color at times I don't use it often at all um, there isn't a white in here because I don't use um, watercolor in an opaque manner which is um, what you tend to use white for in watercolor because of course you don't need white to make a color lighter okay so we're going to start and we're going to fill up the wells of color now I've done here a sort of graded rainbow scale as far as I can see I always get a bit confused as to where the greens should sit because they sit near the yellows and the browns and the blues but anyway I'm really happy with this so you should have a think about how you want your colors to sort of sit in the palette um, and yeah the other thing that's always really important is to make sure you've got a really good sort of primary color example in there and then your secondaries and of course if you're doing botanical painting making sure you've got a nice range of greens and then all the colors that can be made up with green but let's just let's get going so um, I am going to use uh, these tubes and squeeze them into the, t the palettes there now sometimes if you, especially if you have a new tube of paint it's really good to just give it a little bit of a squeeze before you start because sometimes you get a sort of watery residue that comes out and I am going to just squeeze a lot quite a lot of paint and I'm just going to fill up the sort of the bottom half there and that is a uh, cobalt violet um, I use a mixture of Windsor and Newton and De La Rowney, uh paints but it's always the professional quality. Now you'll see as I put the paint in to the palette, first off the big difference between the color that comes out and the color that's uh, displayed on the front and that's because of course with watercolor the moment you start to add water it really comes alive. Um, so Opera Rose and Permanent Rose are two colors that I use an awful lot of with flower painting. Um, it's amazing actually the difference isn't that obvious on the tube but you can soon see there's a real change there now here we've got some lovely sort of uh, alizar and crimson which is a really deep intense pinky red color um, i really really enjoy having a big range of these red colors because it just comes up so often when i'm 
painting all my flowers and also adding red to a Prussian blue or a dark blue presents you with the most amazing kind of aubergine skin colour which just gives you uh, another option if you're looking for a colour that sort of looks like black but isn't quite black. Okay, so cadmium orange. Cadmium um, is a word that pops up quite frequently in a lot of the sort of more regularly used colours and cadmium is actually a property that makes uh, that particular paint just a little bit more opaque. So if you have the word cadmium on your tube, so there we go, cadmium yellow pale there, that means that it's going to be just the tiniest bit more opaque when you pop it in. There we go, nice big tube there. And the lovely thing is having all these colours in one palette just means that I've got it all in one place and I'm not having to worry. Now this tube I've had for seven years. Um, lemon yellow is not a colour I use that much because I use cadmium yellow quite so much but it is really useful but I'm also aware that it may be a little bit stiff to get out the tube so let's just see. Oh, yeah there's not a lot coming out there so this is also a handy reminder for me that I probably need to get a little bit more. But yeah, I mean, tube watercolor paint is essentially exactly the same as um, half pan, pan watercolor paint. Um, they are just dried out block versions of the same thing. Okay, so we've got through our pinks, purples, reds, yellows. Now we're getting into our browns. Um, raw umber is uh, a colour that I don't use that much but it's kind of kind of handy. I'm more of a sienna girl. A burnt sienna is probably one of my... Oh, what did I drop in there? Oh, we're okay. Um, one of my most re frequently used... I'm going to keep coming around the corner here. Okay. Now these four little uh, things here aren't it technically... Um, colour wells like the others because all of these have a sloping uh, a sloping well but I want to use up these little ones so I've got a, like a continual line going on. You can just use the palette you know it, how you choose it's, it's not like a hard and fast rule. Okay Mars Black. I tell you there's one colour in here which I don't have currently which is Payne's Grey which I do think is pretty fantastic. So I'm going to leave a space for that one because I want to put that in there. Ivory black. Quoi. Now Prussian blue is an all-time favourite of mine. It gets used so regularly. I have an awful lot of it. So we'll just fill up there. We're able to fill up sort of in the in the deeper part of the well for these ones, which is very handy. Okay, French Ultramarine, we're now getting into a range of blue tones which are just so brilliant and useful for when you're wanting to create shadow but you're just, you know, black is going to be too extreme. Here we go. Cobalt Deep Blue. Yeah, the, and if you mix a blue with a nice bit of, nice bit of brown, you'll get all sorts of wonderful inky petroly colours. So these tubes really do last a long time. This is another one that's been with me since the beginning. Um, let's see how it goes. Probably a little bit stiff as well. Oh no, that's looking good. Wow, that's amazing. So I think what's just really important, as you can see I've not done a very good job here, is keeping the neck of your tube nice and clean and free from clogged up paint because then as soon as you make it a bit harder for the lid to screw back on, that's when you're going to start getting your paint not being preserved quite as well as it could have been. Okay, we've got some lovely cobalt turquoise there. A few little flakes coming off, just blow that off. Yeah, didn't blow off. <laughs> um, hooker's green, I'm getting there. I have conveniently got enough tubes for my pans and with one or two extra spare. Sap green, possibly the most used colour for me. 
and then Green Gold, which is a real unsung hero, I think. It's absolutely fantastic. And the colour you see in the palette there is just, it just does not do justice to how vibrant and bright this is. Okay, so we've got our palette now. Just get rid of these little flaky bits. So this is all good. Um, the other issue um, we have with this palette is not knowing now <laughs> what all these colours are. So what I'm going to be doing next is doing a little accompanying chart to go with these. So what I'm going to be doing is writing out all the names and then also doing a little colour swatch of this. So all you need to do this as well is to get a piece of watercolour paper, a pencil and a ruler and just mark out a rough demarcation of what you've got in your palette and then we can cut it out and keep it next to it. I mean because this palette folds over this isn't the kind of thing you could keep in inside because you've got paints on both sides it just wouldn't be very sensible but it's a really handy thing to have to one side. Um, also this palette has one of these fancy flip thumb things so you can sort of hold it stick your brushes in there it's really fantastic but again I probably would take a slightly smaller palette with me uh, if I was sort of going on the move to, to paint. Now before we get going with this there's one other important thing that I found while using this palette and that is it's a little bit unwieldy, a little bit wobbly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a bit of blue tack um, or just this is actually white tack isn't it? Just a little bit of this to stick underneath two of the outer edges. So a little bit of blob under there and a blob there. And it's going to work sort of both as a sort of grounding tool, but also just to keep it in place if you ever need to. Okay, so I'm going to pop that to one side. Actually, I'll pop it over here, being a left-hander. I'm going to paint on this side. And then we can just squish it down a little bit. I lose my, I lost my blue tech. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay, so press it down, press it down. For me, that's just really helpful. Okay, I made that look super easy, not. Okay, let's get our color chart out. And I've got me some water just probably just out of shot up there and I'm going to use a large brush size six and I'm just going to wet it and actually I'm going to have two jars of water here one that is going to get increasingly dirty as I keep on changing colors and this one will be for just cleaning a wet brush off again okay so we're gonna get started and we'll go up here with the cobalt violet and I don't want too much on the brush. That's the cool thing, it just all stays in there because of that little, little slope. And I can just paint a lovely color, clean off the brush. And we'll move down along. So now we've got permanent rows and you can just start to see how amazing the colors start to look once we've added a bit of water to them. Because it is, it is hard to tell, especially if you're new to watercolor. Okay, then we've got opera rose. Beautiful, almost like Barbie pink, isn't it? Let's see. Wow. And I'm just doing a sort of a fairly bright but dilute version of the colour, a sort of fairly standard uh, kind of colour thickness. So the brush is just going in the water to get clean and then 
have to get wet in the next one. So what have we got here? We've got Alazarin Crimson here, a really beautiful dark sort of dramatic red. And the other thing is, don't forget, you can mix all of these colours from a limited colour palette. The, um, the 12 pan set that I use quite a lot in my watercolour for beginners series, and that's not even professional quality watercolour, that's student quality, and it still does a great job. Um, you just got to make sure you've got a decent primary set, so that's red, blue and yellow. And then uh, you really can make an awful lot from just that, but I mean obviously that's that's making quite a lot of work for yourself. So we've got two reds here that are fairly similar, but always useful, and especially if we've got the space, why not fill it up, hey? So I'm continuing to clean off my brush in the what is now becoming a very colourful jar of water and then just wetting it in what is still a nice clean jar of water. Right, cadmium orange, here we go. And what's really nice as it starts to sort of get lived in this palette, I can also see just from the sort of residue in the palette the sort of lighter versions of these colors anyway so that's quite handy if I don't always have this color chart to hand so what's interesting is the cadmium orange really clings to the brush and doesn't want to let go so that's another sort of byproduct of the cadmium presence in here I've always found the yellow ochre a little bit sticky, um, a little bit gooey as a paint. That's just my observation. Again, it's the professional watercolour, but they, they do all hold different qualities. It's interesting. So this is quite a nice sort of just exploration of your colours. I, I think this is a really handy thing to do when you're starting out or when you get new paints is just to sort of get introduced to them really. Um, get to know them, see how they behave. Yeah, I know they're sounding a bit like people, but I do spend a lot of time with my watercolours, so uh, it's not surprising that I think like that of them. And I always say that paints have, certain colours have different personalities, certain ones are more pushy than others. Now, speaking of being a bit pushy, let's see, I just need a little bit more water to wake up the lemon yellow because it is a little bit more dried out than the others. But what a beautiful colour. Next one along, Windsor yellow, this one. It's quite lemony again, so it might be quite a good substitute if my lemon yellow doesn't hold out on me. So this is definitely a sort of luxurious approach to using watercolour. You really don't need all of these colours but the other thing is, is I, I've gathered them over time and I currently have them all sort of rattling about all the tubes in a little box which I get out and sort of scatter across the desk in dramatic fashion whenever I start a painting and then I sort of pick about and try and find try and find what I'm looking for. Okay, so now we're into the brown territory. And we're moving across. Oh look at that, lovely. Lovely colour. Really chocolatey. Even with plenty of water that's still nice and strong and that's what you get from artist quality paints is an increased amount of pigment in the paint and pigment is another word for sort of colour really, physical colour. Um, it just means that you don't have to use as much paint to get a vibrant kind of colour. 
Um, and so therefore, some might say that student watercolour or graduate colours are a false economy because you end up using more of them. So do consider that when you're buying your paints. Right, so we'll do this one here. Um, and I think that is a really good tip, like to try and buy the best that you can afford. And then I don't think you'll ever be sorry because the watercolour quality really does come through. Um, I mean, I'm using Dale Rowney and Winsor & Newton, which are two very sort of um, broadly accessible, um, good quality, but not sort of, not elitist paints, I suppose, not really exclusive or independent. There are some amazing independent brands that do very beautiful watercolours and, and create colours that maybe are beyond the realm of some of these uh, more uh, high street brands. So I would encourage you to look and see what's out there in terms of the more independent brands, but you won't go far too far wrong with um, either Windsor & Newton or Dale Rowney. There we go, right, got some Prussian blue, beautiful colour. And actually it's funny, I always think of Prussian blue as being really, really dark, but it's not as crazy dark as I tend to think. I think it's because I always use it in a shadow context. Here we go. Lovely French ultramarine, becoming a little bit more royal blue in its colour, I suppose. I must show you the colour of the uh, the water now. Look at that swamp water. This is usually the moment where I say to my uh, students, "Time to change the water." Well, we probably should have been changed a, a long time before that. Here we go. We're coming up the side. And that one is cobalt blue deep. And then we're now moving on to Windsor Blue, which is a Windsor and Newton colour, funnily enough. I think if I was sort of looking at just getting a, a standard primary colour blue, it would probably be um, Cobalt Blue Deep or French Ultramarine, sort of depending on what I was wanting to paint. Clean off that brush, clean off that brush. Now we're going into slightly more turquoisey territory. And this one is transparent turquoise from, uh, I think this is, which one's this from? This is from uh, De La Rowney, artist quality. So yes, you'll find the wording when they're talking about the sort of the better quality paints, you'll either see professional quality or you'll see artist quality. So look out for those and with the lower uh, quality range, it'll either be student or graduate, which I sometimes think is a little bit counterintuitive because I would always think like a student and a graduate would be the people who'd really want the best, but I guess a student's budget might be a little bit lower than a professional's. But I mean, I'm sure there's many of us professional artists who'd uh, beg to differ. Right, okay, we're still going, we're still going. Now we're on to the greens. And this is Hooker's Green, which is a colour I've been a bit rude about in the past because it's just a bit zingy, but it's great. And actually you can see next to the turquoise that it is a fantastic sort of counterparts it's just got a bit of the the zip and the zing of the bluey colors whereas sap green here it's just a bit more grassy a little bit more old faithful sap green that's how i look at it and very uh strong color like really I mean, you can see there's not much transparency there at all and it's been picked up with the same amount of water as any other colour. And finally, look at that. Green gold. 
beautiful. I'm actually doing a, a PDF for a, a worksheet for a sunflower painting tutorial at the moment and this colour features heavily. So yes, you can also pick up worksheets and PDFs from me um, if you also like having it written out as well as having a video um, from my art supplies workshop. I've done a few flowers that aren't featured in the book. We've got Bluebell, Sweet Pea, Forget, uh, forget Me Not, Foxglove and now the Sunflower. I've basically been trying to be seasonal as they come to me. Okay, so there we go. We've got all our colours from the palette onto our sheet we can see it's a really handy corresponding thing and I've got my gap there for Payne's Grey and I've also got two gaps up there. So what I would recommend now is to write in pencil just around the edge the names of all those of all those colours for your palette and then you can cut that out and have it as a handy companion to this. So there we go, colours all in order we're ready to start painting. Thanks so much for watching. I hope that's helped. It certainly has helped organize my mind before I start painting. So don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you've enjoyed the video. Um, the exciting news at the moment is my book, New Botanical Painting, is only 99p as a Kindle version on Amazon. So the link below is in the episode notes. Um, but of course, you can get your hands on a signed copy of the book at my own website and of course, a watercolor kit. So uh, that should keep you going for a little while. So I look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye.